you were here last Sunday, you know that we began a series of sermons in the book of James. Now, I love James. I love what the book of James teaches. And the more I get into it, the more I love it. And you think it's good now? By the time we get to the end of it, it'll be a lot gooder. It just keeps getting gooder and gooder. I just love it. But this is the thing I see about James. I, I, this is what I see about Christians in general. I think, you know, we want to do right. We want to serve the Lord. We want to be faithful. We want to be effective. But if we're not careful, we get stuck in a rut. We get stuck in mud. And, and Marshall, it's about like the two horses. Uh, Mar Marshall, Marshall had two horses that got stuck in mud just a few weeks ago. I think he used every muscle that he had in his body and probably used muscles he hadn't used in years trying to get those horses out. And unfortunately, one of those horses died. But I think about that. I think about how those horses got stuck, and there's no way those horses were going to get out of that mud by their own, by themselves. It took somebody else to pull them out. And I know that at least Marshall and Monroe was involved in that, and Judy, and probably some others too. But what I think about from my spiritual standpoint, I think that's where some of us are. We're stuck in mud. You know, we, we want, we're, we're in a rut. We want to get out. We want to get from here to here. But there's something that's keeping us from doing that. I think when we get through the book of James, we'll learn a whole lot more about what is causing us to get stuck in the mud. And if we can just change those things and give those things over to the Lord, I think we'll see great things happening in and through us, through the working power of God in our lives. We're going to be looking at James. Let's start with the 12th chapter. We'll go through the 17th chapter. Uh, verse. I uh, just need to make sure you all are listening, okay? It's the first verse, starting with the 12th chapter. The, let's just read, okay? <laughs> Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. No, that was part of what we looked at last week. But we transition over into another section of what James is talking about. Let no one say that when he is tempted, he is being tempted by God. Because God cannot tempt. We cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself, God himself, tempts. No one. But each person is tempted when? When he is lured, when he is enticed by his own desire. Then, desire, when it has conceived, what does it do? It gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it is fully grown, fully mature, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived. My beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from God, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. May God add his blessings to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. You'll notice there when we when we read that, and I think that was verse 13 there, it does not say when we are tempted. Oh, excuse me. It doesn't say if we are tempted. It says when. It's not a matter of if we're tempted. By virtue of the fact that we are of the flesh, we are going to be tempted. And there's none of us that will ever be able to escape that big T word, Temptation. I find it interesting. Wasn't planned this way. Last week we talked about troubles. We talked about trials. We talked about tribulations. Today we're talking about troubles. Excuse me. Temptation. 
And then that's not all the T words we're going to get through. We're going to get through at least one more T word uh, before we get out of uh, the first chapter here. But when I think about this, see, behind that ugly word, that ugly word we refer to as temptation, which we see is the source of many of our own personal problems. And they have a way of corrupting us. So again, I think James is telling us, when you get a control on all of these things here and that have to do with daily living, you can pull yourself. No, let me back up. We can't pull ourselves out. No more than those horses could pull themselves out of that mud. We've got to allow the power of a powerful God reaching down under our submissiveness to pull us out, whether it be trials, troubles, temptation, whatever that might be. Sometimes we find ourselves joking about temptation. But as I look at where we are in personal living, uh, as I look at where we are in general in life today, temptation is really not a joking matter. You see, ever since that war that took place in heaven between God and Lucifer, and Satan was removed from that paradise. We have been affected. This whole world has been affected by that. Temptation has been a part of the experience of every human being alive, ever. I made reference last week to the Bible being the instruction manual, but when I look at James, I see it as being a more personal instruction manual for us because it is here in, in James, in that instruction manual, that it really gives us the clues of what to do and how to prevent being tripped up by Satan. See, that's his goal. If there's any one goal that Satan, the enemy, the adversary has, it's to, it's to trip us up. He doesn't want anything good coming out of our lives. He doesn't want us to be productive. You know, he's happy that we have a lower crowd today and probably disappointed that you're here today. Uh, he, he works in so many ways every day in our life. But this instruction manual gives us some clues on what to do and maybe what not to do. In fact, we are told that God contends that through the power of the resurrection at work in our lives, we can have the capacity, we can have the strength to defeat the evil in our lives. Now let me just stop. Let me make sure that we understand this clearly. Because James opens up in this section of chapter 1 by telling us, God does not tempt us. We might say, well, the devil made me do it. But we can't ever say, well, God made me do wrong. Part of our Sunday school lesson today, I dealt with, you know, God's will will never counteract with God's word. And I think we give the devil a lot of credit, saying, well, that was God's hand at work. God led me to do that. It wasn't God. It was the devil at work there. Now, God may allow the conditions, and God may allow the environment in which temptation and testing takes place. But God will never tempt us with sin. Sin is totally contrary to the will and the teachings of God. We read that in verse 13. I'm not going to go back uh, over that, but you might want to flash that up on the screen when I make reference to that, Nathan. But even when we pray the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but what? Deliver us from evil. Now, what I think that really means when we look at that and try to uh, parallel that with our own personal life, let us not face that temptation when we are tempted by the evil one. Let us not succumb to it. Temptation in and of itself is not a sin. If that was the case, then Jesus would have sinned. Jesus was tempted, but he lived a sinless life. 
So we know that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Let's look at some things that I gather from this passage here that I think will help us have a deeper understanding in dealing with temptation. First of all, we need to have a very clear understanding of how controlling and how powerful temptation can be. Temptation takes all kinds of forms, all kinds of shapes in everybody's life. I don't care whether you're young or whether you're old. Temptation can get us all. Now, the Bible tells us that there is power at work right now. There is an evil power at work right now all across the world. And, and that power, uh, that, that their, their work, their mission is to undermine God's desire and God's design. We see it every day. We can call it the devil at work. We can call it Satan. We can call it the enemy. We can call it the adversary. But whatever we call him, he is real. Even Jesus himself had to wrestle with the powers of Satan as he was tempted there uh, in the desert. The temptation is powerful, and it is powerful against every one of us. We will all have to face it. We all do face it. You may be faced with the temptation of not coming to church today. That's still a temptation that is not a part of God's will. So how do we deal with it? How do we distinguish between being a Christian and not being a Christian and looking at temptation? Now, if you don't remember anything else I say today, you remember this. Unless we have a living, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. When it comes to dealing with temptation, depending on whether we are a believer, whether we lean upon him or not, we will either walk out the victim or the victor. We can have victory over those things that can bring us down. But sadly enough, the problem all across our land is we sometimes forget to rely upon that relationship, that relationship with Jesus Christ that can give us that strength and that power and change our own hearts and minds in dealing with the big T word. We make choices. We make choices every day. Some of those choices are good. Some of those are to our advantage. Some of those we can step back and say, that was the right choice. God, thank you for helping me make that decision. But then because we are free moral agents, we can make poor choices. We can make wrong decisions. And then we can find ourselves victimizing ourselves by trying to blame others. Have you seen that? I hear it all the time. You have too. Well, that's God's fault. Or the devil made me do it. Well, if it wasn't for Eve and that stupid apple, we wouldn't be where we are today. Heard that not too long ago. Or it's my parents' fault. It's my coach's fault. It's my kid's fault. We always like to point the finger at somebody else, don't we? Sometimes we just have to stop. Say, okay, Lord, let's get, let's get real with each other. This is my fault. I made a poor choice. I'm accountable for it. And realizing that it's wrong and move forward. We, we all live east of Eden. And when I came upon that phrase this week, I thought that would rather make a good title for a sermon. We all live east of Eden. I may be developing something up here for too long on that. But until we take responsibility for our own sins, until we take responsibility for our own wrong actions, then we won't rely on God. But we need to rely upon him for that strength so that we can indeed have that victory that we long for. As I made reference to a moment ago, temptation in and of itself is not sinful. But temptation is an appeal to sin. There first must be 
and enticement. And I believe what we saw on the screen in the words, use the word enticement. There is that appeal. And, and once that enticement is able to hook its ugly claws into us, then if we're not in a right relationship with God, then that temptation can take us anywhere the devil wants it to go. Verse 15, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now look at James. In his writing here, I, I see that he links himself in with so many other writings in Scripture when it comes to the tempting power of the adversary and warning us against that and showing us what we need to do to resist to that. In fact, James even says over in the fourth chapter, which we'll hear a little later on in a few weeks, submit yourself to God. Resist the evil and he will flee from you. Now, there's a whole lot more that can be said about that. We will say something later. The second lesson that I see out of this passage right here is we. We as believers must be obedient to the teachings and to the insight of God's word. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Don't be deceived. Now, the Bible clearly teaches us that there are some thoughts, that there are some ideas out there that we just do not need to place in our hearts. And when we see that happening, what do we do? What do you do? What are we supposed to do? We need to stop right where we are. Okay, God, we need to talk. Joan Rivers never was one of my biggest uh, fans, but something should always say is, we got to talk. Sometimes I think God says that to us. We got to talk. And when he talks, we need to listen. And when we talk to him, I'm already convinced that he's listening. But sometimes we just need to stop where we are. And so I've got to change plans. I've got to change my direction. I'm not going on the right course right here. It reminds me of what the psalmist does who tries to encourage us to walk in the path of the godly. And then what we, isn't that a desire of our heart? Isn't that what we want to do? To walk in the path of the godly. Because if we're not, it'll come back to bite us. See, the Bible tells us about many people who had to deal with temptation. Some of those people dealt with it very good. And there's a reason why they did. There's other people that had to deal with the miserable outcome because they didn't deal with it properly. Let's just look real quickly. And with these particular two, although there's many others, but we see sexual immorality coming about. And one fell to its power, and the other was able to resist it. Genesis, the 39th chapter, we've got the story of Joseph. Remember that? Remember Potiphar's wife? And he, she, attempts to seduce him, but he resists the powers of her advances. And it, it really cost him. It was at his own personal risk that he did that. But by the time it was all over, God honored him for his resistance. And then we get over to First and Second Samuel. We read the story of David and Bathsheba. Perhaps one of David, if not the greatest failure of David, is when he gave attention to the forces of desire and allowed himself to be caught up in something that you know the rest of the story. He didn't want to, didn't feel like it, resisting that temptation. And then thirdly, we cannot look in the wrong places. Sometimes we put ourselves in the wrong places and we set ourselves up 
verse 17, talks about coming, our blessings coming from above. Every good and perfect gift. It's not from here. Certainly not from below. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So let's lift up our heads. Let's thank God for his perfect gift, for his many blessings. It astonishes me. It really behooves me when I think about everything going on. When I think about all the generations that have come down the pike, and I'm talking about generations of Christian people who choose to believe the lies of Satan over the truths of God's word. That'll take us where we don't want to go. In closing, I think this is a great story of a man who goes ice fishing. He cuts a hole in the ice and he positions his little folding chair right there at that hole, takes his line and hook, dips it down into that water. After a few minutes, there's a voice that says, there are no fish there. He looks around, didn't see anybody. So what does he do? He picks up his chair, goes to another spot, cuts another hole in the ice, sticks that same line and hook down in that hole. He's not catching anything. And then there's another voice that says, there are no fish in that hole. He jumps up and says, what in the world's going on? He didn't see anybody. What's going on? Who is this? And he says, this is the manager of the ice rink. There are no fish here. And I only say that to say this. Sometimes we go fishing in the wrong places. Sometimes we find ourselves in places we don't need to be. And we can't be looking for the right things in the wrong places. See, I believe that if we are going to be in tune to God's word, we have to be in tune to God's will. And over and over again, as we study scripture, we are told that we are to build our lives upon the things that are meaningful, the things that are abundant, the things that are significant. And if we don't, we find ourselves walking down the wrong course. We find ourselves fishing out of the wrong home. See, we have a tendency to think that by getting into God's word and living out what it says, that God's trying to keep us from having fun. That he don't want us to have that excitement. But what he's trying to do is to tell us what we need to do to prevent other problems down the road. God's word is not a negative. It is a positive. And we can see that positive influence by the way we live that out. God's just trying to teach us the right thing. Oscar Wilde, that great writer, said there are two tragedies in life. Not getting what you want and getting what you deserve. A lot of truth to that. See, folks, we cannot resist all the temptation in the wrong places if we're not looking in the right places. And unless we live, unless we build our lives upon God's word, the promises of God's word, that's why I think it's a part to be a part of the family of God. It's significant to you individually and personally, but it also advances the cause of the kingdom. That's why it's important that we constantly seek to be under the guidance, the influence of the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. We cannot allow the seductive powers of temptation to divert us down the road of life that God does not want us to go. A long time ago, at a place called Calvary, Jesus bruised the serpent's head. Isaiah talked about that, remember? And because of this, the devil 
was defeated. Oh, he's still at work. He's winning the battle. If we let him. <clears throat> but he's not going to win the war. We know that. See, we need not only to resist him and he will flee, but we need to be able to convince ourselves that as we get into God's word, we can say, I can do this. I can do this. Got myself this week trying to encourage somebody. You, you can do this. You can do this. You say you can't. You can't in and of yourself. But you can do it with God's help. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You know that one, Philippians 4.13, one of my favorite verses. Do you know what that rightly, rightly translated, do you know what that means? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That means, God, there's nothing that you and I together can't get through. We need to be reminded, whether it's temptation, whether it's trials, tribulations, adversities, all kinds of things. There's nothing going on in your life right now or has or will that you, coupled with the strength and the power and the presence of God, cannot get you through. Let's pray.